G'day, I'm Sean and welcome back to the Car Expert Podcast. Today we are going to be going overseas because James is back from Korea and he's going to tell us about a new Kia. Yes. Are you excited? Yes. This has been like, we, we haven't been able to talk about it for a while because you kept teasing it, but there's been a, a, a long embargo, but uh, now we can talk about, what's it called? The EV3. EV3, just working through the numbers there from Korea. <laughs> and Scott, you're here, you're quite excited because you get to talk about a, a McLaren. I do, yeah, got a drive of the updated Artura earlier this week. Uh, drove the pre-update car last year. Timelines are difficult. Um, and there's some really interesting changes. So it's not quite as mass market as the EV3, but it was still good fun. Well, that is to come. But first, let's talk about the top stories on the carexpert.com.au website. Korea's third most popular brand, Sangyong, has officially changed its name to KGM Sangyong Australia in Australia. The company that sells the Musa Ute and the Rexon SUV has been in Australia since the mid-1990s, operating as Sangyong. However, in Korea, the brand has been known as KG Mobility since the KG Group bought a 61% stake in 2022. The name change coincides with the launch of the Torres SUV, which goes on sale at the end of October. Audi Australia says its focus on customer service will help its vehicles stand out against the flood of new brands on the market. Audi CEO Jeff Mannering told Car Expert, there's a lot of Chinese manufacturers coming. What happens in the next five years, you're going to have a flood of 40 to $75,000 cars. Whilst that may seem like good news to the consumer, Mr. Mannering cast doubt on whether some of these newcomer brands will be able to offer the same level of service and support as his company. If something happened to the car, if there was a recall or you had to do a service, where's the infrastructure to be able to do it, he said. Toyota has stated it won't follow the likes of Mitsubishi and MG in offering long new car warranties. MG came out swinging earlier this year, bumping its seven-year unlimited kilometer warranty out to 10 years for 250,000 kilometers, surpassing Mitsubishi who offer a 10-year, 200,000 kilometer conditional warranty. A number of manufacturers, including Kia, currently offer a seven-year warranty. Toyota, who held out for longer than most with the traditional three-year warranty, currently offer a five-year unlimited kilometer warranty with the option to extend to a seven years on the drivetrain if the vehicle is serviced on time and within the Toyota dealer network. Leave a comment, let us know, would you prefer a long warranty when buying a new car? All right, guys, before we dive into talking about the cars you've been driving, um, I do need to talk about Volkswagen because according to a report, uh, this is I don't know whether this is actually 100% well, approved and authorized and officiated, but uh, a, a report says that the VW finance chief, I'll probably butcher this, Arno Antlitz. Unbelievably good. <laughs> uh, attended a staff meeting with around 25,000 employees telling them that they need to work with management to cut spending. Uh, and he was met with a bit of heckling from the audience. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, we've heard lots of things about European numbers being down. Obviously, we're seeing it here in our own numbers that there's not as much desire for these sort of German vehicles. But is Volkswagen in a bit of trouble at the moment? I think most brands, are, if they're not in trouble, they are having to look really hard at their spending. And it's a combination of factors that's driving it. Partly, it's competition from places like China. Uh, all of a sudden, the electric car market is being dominated and driven in Australia, at least by cars built in, in China. And that's really tough to match if you are Volkswagen and building these cars in Germany. The other challenge is the cost of electric vehicles. Uh, up front, the development costs are massive. And between the fact that sales are down compared to the pre-COVID era, between the fact that these brands have to invest huge amounts of money in new factories and new technologies, and the fact that the market is shifting in a way that means maybe they don't get to sell as many of these electric cars as they expected, it's a really challenging time. And at Volkswagen, that's led to obviously some turmoil and a few challenges with the unions, which are very powerful in Germany. Yeah, so I mean, are they CFMEU level? Are they a bit, a bit more, a bit less? So I, I'm not an expert on German industrial relations, unfortunately. Uh, it's not quite CMFEU because it's, uh, it's not militant, this union. It's not like where, you know, we have bikies out there as have recently come out in reports in Australia. Allegedly. Allegedly, correct. Um, the, the German unions are very powerful, though, because they have seats on the board of management at Volkswagen and at their rival car makers, and there are really strong worker protections in place. So it's not uncommon for people at these German car makers to spend their whole life there. Um, Porsche, for example, when I was last in Stuttgart, got shown around by someone who started as a grad and was in his 70s wow. working in the Porsche Museum. And partly that's because, obviously, he was really passionate about the brand, but also once you're in, if you're doing a good job, there's a really strong ladder to climb and there's really strong support for workers. It does mean though that when Volkswagen wants to cut spending and by cut spending it means cut jobs, just to be very clear, um, it, it can't just push that through in the way maybe it would be able to in other countries. It needs to work with the head of each individual union that governs the different factories and the different parts of the factory to, to get that approved and ticked off at a board level. And 
these unions are in the interests of protecting workers. So unless there is a very good reason, and what Arno Antlins is trying to communicate here is if we don't cut some jobs and cut some spending, the company is in a much bigger sort of spot of bother and even more jobs will go. Um, but it's not just a matter of them snapping their fingers or swiping a pen and, and cutting these people. So another thing that um, her antlets went on to say was, uh, we've been spending more money at the brand than we earn for some time now. This can't go well in the long term. If we carry on like this, we won't succeed in transformation. Now, obviously, and, and James, I know you can speak to this a bit, the transformation is obviously relate, uh, relating to electrification, move away from internal combustion. Um, there was a rumour last week that they might shut down two factories, including the one that makes the ID3. Where does... What does that mean? What does that say for their confidence in it? Yeah, so, so for a bit of background, this kind of spending and um, you know money finances related stuff, you know, dates back to the Dieselgate scandal. So Volkswagen had to shift its entire strategic operations to start focusing on electrification and you know investing in a completely new powertrain type costs money. So there was all of the there was the drivetrains, there was the connected vehicle systems that took a lot of time and a lot of money. Then they launched it. And they fumbled that as well because there were software issues with the ID3. The Golf has um, the related systems in there as well. And on top of that, they lost sales. The Golf was the number one selling vehicle in Europe for I don't know how many years, over nearly two decades and lost out just in the last couple of years. And a lot of these issues require you to then update the product, which we've seen. They've brought out the Mark 8.5 and a lot of their other products as well. They've had to heavily invest in renewing these products or improving them based off customer feedback. Um, the ID3 received a very major midlife facelift only a couple of years in, into its life. Um, the same for the, the their larger ID models that are also on that platform. They've brought out a new motor and other you know battery improvements very, very quickly into the car's life cycle. All of these things cost money. And if sales continue to slow down, then that presents another problem because the return on investment is not very high. So there's this bit, Volkswagen has had this big vision to go be all electric. I think it was by 2030 at one point, now they've pushed it back to 2035. The, the sales mix was meant to be, you know, one or two million uh, yearly electric vehicles globally by I think 2025 or 2027. They've had to walk back on that as well because as market trends change, that obviously means that they have to adjust their planning. And it's the same sort of stuff that's been discussed here that you know market trends are changing, their sales and their revenue are changing. So if something doesn't change in a couple of years down the track, they could be in some real trouble. And you know, you look at Volkswagen's very big in China, but a lot of manufacturers produce their cars domestically there. So if that's where all the volume's coming from, why are they necessarily building them back at home in Germany, which is probably more expensive than building it in some other nations and things like that. So there's a lot of factors there that contribute to that. Um, and so it, I guess that's why we've seen a lot of scrambling from them at a global level to improve a lot of their models and get things back on the right track to hopefully regain some sales ground because yeah, I think, and it's not just Volkswagen. There's a lot of manufacturers having to deal with this as well. It is really interesting, sorry to cut you off, Sean, but Volkswagen has, I suppose, been the master of platform sharing. All of the brands now do it, and they have these toolkits where you have a whole lot of different parts that can be put together in different ways to give you, in the case of Volkswagen, everything from a Golf through to a Passat, for example. Um, and across the Volkswagen brand, across all of the brands within its stable, you spend a lot of money up front to develop it, but then from there, you can break that cost down over so many vehicles over such a long time that it's a really efficient way to do business. And that's part of the reason that Volkswagen has been so successful in the modern era. It nailed this production method. And then from there, it's just gradually refined it. And even the new Golf is on a pretty heavy development of the last Golf, which is a heavy development of the one before. The engine in the Golf GTI a version of it debuted in the Mark V GTI, and it's just been gradually improved from there, and it's a very cost-effective way to do business. That's what it wants in this electric era as well. The MEB platform James is talking about is meant to be a modern interpretation of MQB, which is what's underpinned its most recent era of petrol cars, save for some of the really high-end stuff. Um, every time it has to go back and make changes to MEB, it has to make out-of-sync updates, it has to change its business structure, its factories, that's time that rather than making money from these and the cost of it being gradually whittled down on a per unit basis, it's rising and rising and rising. And that would be making people really nervous. It's also, there's a lot of uncertainty around, like you were saying, the factories that I suppose make it really hard to confidently invest money if you're Volkswagen. It's talked a couple of times about a new factory it wants to build to build its hero Trinity electric car. The plans around that keep changing. Where it's gonna build the ID3 has changed a couple of times. And, all of that uncertainty, even though it's not costing money in a, we're spending it to build the factory sense, 
It costs money because you can't, you can't plan ahead confidently in what production is going to look like in a couple of years at these factories and how much each MEB platform is going to cost to develop and how you can while that cost down over time. And that adds up really quickly as well. All of a sudden, you look at the long term and the point where you start making big money off these platforms and these vehicles gets pushed further back. So I guess, I guess how does that affect us? Because obviously, our supply does come mostly from where all the rest of the supply comes from as well and uh, across Skoda, uh, Cupra, uh, and the Volkswagen stuff, it's pretty much all same sort of area and factories that are affected by this. Is that gonna affect prices in, in Australia going forward, supply, or uh, uh, we don't know yet? Yeah, it's an interesting thing. So um, with the bulk of Volkswagen, so I think this is a Volkswagen brand issue as opposed to a group issue, because it doesn't seem to be too much about you know, various Audi factories and because Skoda's um, might have Boleslav factories in Czechia, like that doesn't need to be affected. Like, I think this is a Volkswagen brand issue. Um, in terms of what it means for Australia, I guess it, we've seen that Volkswagen has, in Australia at least, has perhaps seen a, a sales slide as well due to increased prices of their vehicles off the back of increasing production costs and the various technologies that they bake into their cars. Um, all of their recent launches, it's, it's made, been made very clear that the next lot of vehicles coming, so the new Golf, the new Tiguan, all of the new Skoda, Cupra stuff, is gonna drive really hard on value and sort of maintain or slightly adjust current price points, but put more stuff in there because competition is very, very fierce in our market. We may not be huge by global standards, but we are one of the most competitive markets in terms of other brands. We've got a very high mix of, you know, Asian. Um, now the Chinese players are really undercutting these, these legacy brands. If they don't do something about it, they're in a lot of trouble. Um, we're starting to see now that the Asian brands are starting to come back up again and the gap's closing again, which is probably an opportunity there for Volkswagen to sort of be in contention from a price bracket perspective, but still have that, you know, that European influence, the, the, the perception of quality and, and technology that it's still very well known for. And as we've seen with some of their recent launches, like the new Touareg is excellent. Mm. It's managed to make, you know, adjust its price point to be very, very competitive as other brands have had to move up. So I think it'll be really interesting to see what they do with the ID4 and ID5, where we're, we're anticipating a pricing announcement very soon. And they've been very coy about it because I think they've had to adjust it a number of times. And one of the reasons is because with our incoming emission standards and that situation kept, keeps on changing. It de depends on that, then what pool of vehicles allocation that we get, because originally it might've been a very small pool and they were, might've had to have a higher price to keep a profit margin. And then now we have access to more and therefore you can sort of spread it out a little bit wider. And also the market keeps changing as well. And to sort of circle back to what Scott was saying before about you know, ever changing things, you know, the MQB platform and the EA888 engine, as an example, have been able to be at the, at the front of the line in terms of development for those things. Mm. So, you know, that platform has been very, very good and in line, if not ahead of market standards for a very long time. The same with that engine. It's been refined to the point where it's always been a benchmark. You look at MEB and unfortunately, the way that electric vehicles constantly are being developed and improved, the technology just keeps on changing. And so, you know, we've got solid states coming in very soon. You've got, you know, charging infrastructure, you know, Volkswagen stuff charges at about 175 kilowatt mark. You've got some of the Asian brands quoting 350, and then we've got new stuff coming that will be even quicker. It's just really hard to have a, a stable commitment or planning in place to, you know, cater for things that we don't even know exist yet. So I can imagine it's a very, very difficult job. I know we've been on this a while now, and we probably need to move we on. Do, but um, we have been insulated from some of this chaos in Australia because we haven't actually had the ID3, ID4, ID5. We get the Cooper Born which doesn't quite have a full feature set, but it's also launched in a form that is, I suppose, better refined and rounded than the ID3 in Europe. Because we are a fair way behind the curve, we haven't had emission standards. We didn't get the first ID3 or ID4 here, and that means the cars that are coming late this year, early next, will be the more refined versions that are being rolled out in Europe. So as much as there's been frustration from buyers and from Volkswagen that it can't get this new product, one of the perks has been that we will be getting a more refined, call it generation 1.5, as opposed to the first gen stuff that has led to some of these problems. Well, if you want to know more about it, I will put links in the show notes uh, to the articles that detail all this on the carexpert.com.au website. And uh, are you wanting to help out Volkswagen maybe buy one of their cars? Well, have I got a deal for you? Well, actually, I have a page full of them. All you need to do is go to Google, type in help me car expert, or use the QR code on the screen. It's gonna take you to the car expert website. We're a big company. It's like over 60 full-time employees. Very impressive. 
We also have a page on the site with all of the deals going in Australia this month to help you figure out which car you need to pick. We can then even put you in touch with one of our friendly dealers who might even be able to get you a better deal as well. So go to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert or whip your phone out, scan the QR code and away you go. All right, James, it's time. Take us to Koreatown. Tell us all about the EV3. Yeah, so the EV3 is um, Kia's new entry-level electric vehicle. It's going to be here in the late first quarter of next year, early second quarter. So it's March to April. Um, we don't know how much it'll cost. We don't know which models are coming here yet, <laughs> but... I got a first drive with the first wave of media that were able to access it in Seoul. Um, so we did like a really long 200 and something, 200-ish kilometer drive throughout um, various parts of Korea and it was, um, had a really good experience. The review's now live now on the site, but I'm gonna throw to myself, I'm doing a walk around of the car right now. <laughs> Hi guys, I've jumped out of the studio from Melbourne into Seoul and I'm here now with the brand new Kia EV3, which we've been driving for the last day. I'm gonna give you a quick walk around just so you know what to expect when it arrives in Australia early next year. So as you can see, the lighting and the design is very much baby EV9. That's kind of the theme here. This one is the one, probably a high spec earth variant, which is not GT line, so like the crossover style version. So you get the option of these cool, you know, wall plug alloy wheels and if you head around there's all these like nice straight lines with sharp creases and the like and it's the same story here with the rear lighting so very baby EV9 there. Behind this tailgate is a over 400 litres of cargo space, which is very big for the class, given this is about the same size as a Seltos. I'll have a separate video for that on socials. And if you head around with me over here, I'll show you quickly show you the interior. So a big part of this is that even though this car is quite small, it's got a very open and spacious cabin. You've got a very slab sided, open plan. You get these dual 12 inch displays, which are straight out of the EV9, including the digital climate control unit. Uh, you've got this really cool console here with a moving table, so you can use it as a mobile workspace, or well, that's what Kia says that people will do with it. And you've got some cool open storage here. So you've got cup holders, wireless phone charger, and then a place there to store, maybe a small bag or something like that. And this also moves to get things out of your way. This one has a cool navy over ivory trim and there's a number of different options that you can get but we're not sure what's going to happen with Australia yet. This one has the long range 81 kilowatt hour battery which is good for about a hundred, not a hundred, 605 kilometers of range and it, they're all driven by a 150 kilowatt front motor at launch but there will be all-wheel drive and GT all-wheel drive versions launching in the future. Stay tuned for all our coverage and I'll see you guys back in Melbourne very soon. Well, uh, James. You look like you're having a great time in Korea there, whilst yeah. we were here doing all the work. Didn't even ruffle okay. my hair with all the teleporting that I've done in the last couple <laughs> It's amazing, it's amazing. You looked so fresh only an hour behind the rest of us here. Um, okay, so where does this sit in terms of the Kia lineup? Like, is this a, sort of a Seltos replacement? Is that the idea? I don't know if it's going to, yeah, I don't know if it's going to replace those cars. Um, it sort of will be similar in size to a Seltos, so like dimensionally it's about that size. Um, it kind of sits alongside the Nero as well, which is priced differently. Okay but it sits below the EV5. Well, we think it's priced differently because we don't know how much the EV3 well, costs. Well, yeah, we, our understanding is, is that it will be cheaper than the Nero, the same way the EV5, which is sportage size, will also be cheaper than the Nero. Seems it's, like the Nero's on the way out. Yeah, <laughs> which, yeah which again, I, I just wrote a story as well about how Kia Australia will continue to have the Nero in Australia as long as the market wants it. And globally, I think it's quite popular enough in markets like Europe, the UK and Korea that there will be some sort of crossover period or a time that it will yeah. stay on sale. Um, so the EV3 is sort of like a, a new age um, entry level EV. It kind of looks like a baby EV9. It's, it's very like TARDIS inside, very upright bluff, very space efficient. It's got a huge 460 litre boot, which is pretty big for a car that size. And you know, in, depending on where you are in the world, it'll compete with everything from like the Volvo EX30 and Volkswagen ID3 to the BYD Addo3 and some of the other Chinese stuff that's on the market here. Um, so small body, does that mean short range? No, so there, there are two battery versions available globally at launch. I, I would assume that we'll lead with the long range one, which is an 81 kilowatt hour battery. 81? It's That's a big battery for a little small car. car. Yeah. Absolutely, wow. which means it has 605 kilometers of WLTP. Wow. It might actually do it, might be the first electric car that does its claim range. This is the thing. So it gives you, um, Kia's new EVs give you like a, a range readout as well as like your best and worst reading. And so on the launch, it was easily showing us over 600 Ks from when we left the beginning of the drive. And you know, it was it was pretty hot up there. Like this is why I'm so rugged up now. It was like 32 <laughs> degrees and humid every day there. So we had the air con running, the ventilated seats and everything. And we were doing, I think it was just under seven kilometers per kilowatt hour, which works out to sub 15 kilowatt hours per hundred kilometers, which kind of worked out to at least 550 Ks of range in like summer real world driving. So, so it's like Tesla 
sort of yeah. numbers there. That's pretty good. It's actually, it's very, very impressive. Now, look, dimensionally, it's smaller than a Model Y and it doesn't have like the massive frunk and, you know, all the Tesla things that people love about the Model Y. But I think in terms of what the legacy manufacturers are offering, if this can come in in either just under or around that 50 grand mark, it makes something like an Addo 3 look a little bit old hat. Mm. And, you know, obviously with Kia's dealer network, warranty offering, cap price servicing, I think a lot of people will trust it because you think of all the people that have a Seltos, a, a Sportage, maybe even a Rio or Stonic buyer that is looking to make that step into something electric and new. Instead of buying a Sportage, which has a petrol or diesel engine or a hybrid, if you can get your hands on one, you can get something that's full EV, has really long range, and you know it has all the tech that you get in the other Kias. So you know the dual screens from the EV9, you know various other things, all the safety tech, it's all available in that car. How it's spec here will be very interesting to see, but I imagine they'll be very, very competitive with it when, when it gets here because that's where the market is. Yeah, you just said that you think, well, you expect around 50, but wasn't that the expectation with the EV5 was around that 50 to 60 mark anyway? Yeah, I think the EV5 will be probably very well lined up with the Model Y. So if, if the base Model Y is about 55, I, I would assume they'll aim for that. I think where the EV3 has to be positioned, it, it can't be that high. Otherwise sure. you'll have the same thing that the Nero has where mm -hmm. it's almost competing with the EV6. The same, the EV3 and EV5 can't compete like that. Yeah, okay. I think it's not unusual for brands to offer an entry-level big car at the same price as a top-end version of a small car. So there is also a possibility that the EV3 starts obviously much lower than the EV5 and maybe your choice is do I want more space and fewer features or less space and more kit is, is not an unusual way to go about it. All right, so important question, will there be a go fast version? Yes, so Kia has confirmed there will be a GT version. We don't know too much about it um, because it's still under development, um, but they have committed to um, bringing out a dual motor all wheel drive version of the stand, uh, likely of the standard range or whatever, and then have a, a fast one. And so I think, you know, we're anticipating it'll be like 200. 50 kilowatts That's or something like that. A lot of grunting on the car. And I, I didn't hear that from any Kia representative. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, we're, it'll probably be in like the, the five ish six seconds, zero to 100 brackets. So, you know, proper hot hatch territory. Yeah. But I guess, you know, some people might think, oh, you can get like an EX30 for with a sub four seconds, zero to 100 or whatever. That car is much more expensive. I, I imagine that given the size and the positioning of the car, it can't be too, that performance version can't be much more than, you know, a mid 60 grand car. And even then some people might think it's too expensive in the Australian market. So we do know there's a GT coming. Um, so be excited for that. But I imagine we'll lead with the GT line in Australia, which will have all of that styling, just not yeah. all the go. <laughs> and in terms of how they've actually made it affordable, I'm assuming this isn't built on the same platform as the EV6. Is it a cheaper platform underneath. Yeah, so it, from, <laughs> this is another thing. Some of these Asian brands like to be very very vague about these kinds of things. So I believe like the EV5, it's a version of the eGMP platform that underpins all of their new dedicated electric vehicles, but the architecture is a less sophisticated one. So it's a 400 volt architecture mm -hmm. instead of 800 volt. And there were some references to the Neo, the Neo, the Nero's um, electrical system. So I don't know whether they've sort of put some of the older stuff around like charging and stuff because I think it can only charge to about 130 kilowatts in the long range battery whereas so the less other one, than half of what you get in an EV6. Yeah exactly right so th there'll be things like that that they've probably been able to make it cheaper it's obviously a smaller car at this point you know if, if they're going for more volume and have been able to um, better standardize pricing of supplies and things like that that probably will offset the cost as well um, but yeah it's a, it's it, it should be pretty competitive. Is this going to be made alongside the EV5 in China? Is this, is no, this so we're getting one? it from Korea. So okay. the EV3, EV6, EV9 are all from Korea. The EV5 will come from China for us. Yeah, I, I guess even though it, it's coming from Korea, um, people, some people might think, oh, it can't be that cheap because it's going to be Chinese and it hasn't got LFP batteries, it's got um, NMC batteries. But I think Kiev is very um, strong on the point that it understands the market and where it needs to be. And I assume they would have learned a few things from the Nero to be like, if we want people to buy this car, we need to be very, very competitive. And so I, I expect good things. And do we know when it's going to be here? March to April next year is the is the current timeline. Um, that could change, but um, I imagine, yeah, that that's where they're sitting at at the moment. And did you ask them where the hell's the EV5? Yes. <laughs> yep. So I've asked them a number of times now. Um, the the for context, the, the launch was originally meant to be at the end of July. They got pushed back because there was some sort of rolling change at the factory level, so some spec changes that they had to deal with at the port when the cars first came in. And then I think now they're just gonna launch everything at once as right. opposed to doing a staggered launch of all the variants. So at this stage, I think it's still 
fourth quarter, so sometime between October and December. So it will it be could before be March the, to April. Yeah, because <laughs> we got a lot of comments being like, "Why are we talking about EV3 when the yeah. EV5 is not here yet?" The EV5 is coming. It, yeah. it will be here before the end of the year. It will be here before EV3. Just like Star Wars, they're starting with the high numbers of working. Backwards. Exactly right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I think it's time we move on to something slightly faster, but still slightly <laughs> electric. Uh, Scott, McLaren Atura. Now, it, that's not a new car per se, but this, the one that you drove is new. Yes, so the Artura is McLaren's new baby supercar. Uh, it's the cheapest model in the range until the new GTS arrives, which Cheap is, is, a, is a loose term. A most affordable, <laughs> least expensive. Um, the new GTS will undercut it on price. It's the new version of the GT, sort of more relaxed McLaren. Um, but it's a plug-in hybrid V6 twin turbo <gasps> supercar. Sacrilegious. Oh, <laughs> and it had a pretty tough gestation. It was meant to launch and then it was pushed back and pushed back by issues with software. On the initial European launch, there were cars that were catching fire, which is obviously a really bad look. Ooh. McLaren finally got the car launched and we drove it for the first time in Australia last year. Uh, drove it at the Bend in South Australia and really enjoyed it, but it just wasn't quite perfect. It was a little bit flat, the noise, and there were some awkward sort of shifts and things that went on in the plug-in hybrid system. So for 2024, 2025, McLaren launched the Spider, which is built on the same carbon tub, but obviously has a folding hardtop roof. And it applied all of the changes from the Spider, except for the roof, to the coupe, which means more power. So you now get 70 kilowatts and 225 Newton meters from the electric motor, that's unchanged, but 445 kilowatts and 720 Newton meters from the engine, all up. From a V6? From a twin turbo V6. That's wild. All That's up ridiculous. you get 515 kilowatts and electric range is up slightly as well. It's 33 Ks instead of 31 Ks. Flat out, you'll be doing 330. I didn't go that fast on the roads around Sydney. I barely cracked 100. But all of the little changes that McLaren's made have also been passed on to the coupe. And the idea is a slightly better rounded, better to drive take on the original formula. Okay. So it looks like a McLaren. It's just slightly smaller. But um, how does it actually drive? Well, I'm going to do what James has just done and teleport. Uh, I'm going to throw to myself on Sydney roads in electric mode for a very quick intro to what we're doing with the Artura, and then maybe we should talk about that. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Scott Drives a Fast Car Slowly. This time I am not on a racetrack. I am on the roads around Sydney in the new McLaren Artura. And as you can hear, there is no petrol engine going. That's because it's a plug-in hybrid. Got the electric motor running at the moment in comfort and the engine will jump in and out as required. And then when you're in a real hurry, you can unleash 700 PS and 720 Newton meters. McLaren has made some changes to this car for 2025. We are driving the Spider today as well, but I'm in the coupe at the moment. And on the, when we drove the coupe last year, our feedback was mostly centered around the fact that the gearbox felt a little bit awkward in some spots and that it didn't sound all that flash when you were really flat out. This is a V6 instead of a V8 in line with the plug-in hybrid system. So far, based on this early experience, I haven't actually heard the exhaust. You're going to have to check back into the actual podcast on how that sounds. But it is interesting. It does feel quite smooth around town. Jumping between gears, electric motor, petrol, electric, all of that. There's a lot going on and you're not really aware of it. Other thing I'm loving about this car to start with is just how beautiful the steering is. The wheel itself feels great in your hands. Nice and thin and sort of delicate. And just over the road, you can feel it tugging a little bit as the road goes left and right, but it doesn't want to rip the wheel out of your hands. McLaren is known for this stuff, the stuff that drivers really care about, and early on, it is noticeable how much the car wants to tell you about what's going on. Anyway, with that, back to you, Sean. All right, so uh, it drives slowly around the streets of Sydney. That's good. We've got that out of the way. Is it a green car? Because it is a hybrid. Uh, the one I drove was blue. Oh, well, that's but, disappointing. But um, it is quite efficient and economical by supercar standards. So... One of the things McLaren and Ferrari have also said is that people still want supercars. They want look at me cars that drive really well and make them feel something, but they don't want to wake the neighbors up when they have those cars. It's, it's not socially acceptable anymore to have the big noisy V10 or V8, which is where this electric motor comes in. You can cruise out of town on electric power only. And then when you put your foot down, you get the electric motor and the petrol engine working together to give you more performance. So, the Artura will do fully electric mode. It can be plugged into the wall and charged, or if you flick it into track mode, it will then use the petrol engine to charge the battery so you've always got enough power for maximum performance from the electric motor too. Like a curve system. Basically, yeah. yeah. Um, it does have regen braking, so you lift off the accelerator and it will slow itself down in electric mode, but there's no regen through the brake pedal. Okay, does That's that mean every third lap on the track you have to be harvesting with the flashing lights <laughs> yes. in the brake? Yes, <laughs> yeah, you do that thing F1 cars do yeah. where they lift off slightly yeah, and you yeah. get the flashing light and yeah. they get overtaken for no apparent reason. Yeah, Norris is harvesting so Piastri can't overtake Goes around him. the yeah. outside. <laughs> um, no, so 
one of the things that is impressive about this system is you don't really need to think too hard about it. And we started off in electric mode just to make sure the car actually did the electric thing, but you can put it in comfort and it will do electric, it'll do petrol, it'll do combination, and it'll do it all in the background. And the net result is occasionally you'll hear the engine fire up and because it's a powerful engine, you do hear and feel it, but it cuts in really smoothly. And there are times where you're in really strange gears at strange speeds because of how the system works. You'll be in eighth gear at 70 k's an hour because the electric motor is doing most of the pushing and the petrol engine is just giving you a bit of a hand. So it is quite smooth and smart when you're going. One of the challenges with these cars is how all that tech integrates. And we've talked about the C63, you were just talking about a GLC 63. Um, sometimes the handover between petrol and electric when you're flat out isn't great. That's what McLaren's worked on with the gearbox in particular in this car, and that was one really noticeable difference. Okay, so um, one of the things that's sort of throwing me a bit about McLaren is they started off with like, this alphanumeric setup. So yeah. the uh, F1, the fax machine, because I can't remember all the The MP4 12C, which the became one. the 12C. Yes, then you had, you know, 650, 720, 765, like all that. But now they seem to be moving back to just names. Nice. Yeah. Is, this, is this a trend? Is this what we're going to be seeing going forward with McLaren? It certainly seems that way. Um, I know the 750S and the, is it a 765 LT? LT, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, they have maintained their power-based names, and it wouldn't surprise me if in that world they, they stick with that. But McLaren is still a really young company. I think we forget that sometimes. It's only been building cars since that MP4 12C. The F1 was a different sort of project. Was it Mercedes mixed thing, um, wasn't it? BMW. BMW, BMW, sorry, BMW yes. V12. The SLR was, was Mercedes, exactly, yes. yeah. Um, but this modern iteration of McLaren is still very young. Uh, and it's still working out the best way to go about it. And there was a period there where it wanted to do sports series and take on the 911, supercar series and take on the Ferrari world, and then hyper or what do they call it? Ultra? Um, it was some, I think it was Hyper for the P1 right. and the... But the P1 and the Elva, the really limited run stuff they do. And they released a lot of cars really quickly. And I think between the numbers for names, the fact there was a new variant every 12 months, and the fact that the brand was still young, people got a bit lost. The value started dipping of used cars because they were getting usurped so quickly. So along with the revised naming structure, this is part of a clearer push from McLaren to really go, well, we have our entry car, the GTS, we have our Artura, which takes on the lower end hybrid supercars. And then we have our 750S, which is our full on supercar. It's a three car lineup that will, I would imagine, expand to include long tail versions, but it's much simpler. And I suppose the new name is a part of that as well. Mm. So the thing I always loved about McLaren, I'm sure you guys probably do too, it was a company founded by a Kiwi bloke who just yeah. wanted to go racing in Europe. Now they uh, employ a very talented young Australian fella. Uh, they've previously employed a talented young Australian fella as well. <laughs> um, but, but I mean, is this still a business that is that exists to fund the race team or is it a completely separate entity now? So they've always been separate entities. They've just been, I suppose, the same McLaren brand and from the same base. Um, I'm just trying to wrap my head around actually how it works at the moment because they've always been different business units. It's been McLaren road cars, McLaren racing tech, and there is crossover between the two, but fundamentally they're different companies towards different goals. One of the things that um, the regional director for Asia, except for China, her name's Charlotte, uh, who we spoke to during this launch said was, the racing team is quite tightly tied in with the road car team. And that means that there's obviously shared learnings from composites and tech on the track. But also a strong McLaren F1 team means strong interest in the road cars as well, especially in markets like Japan, apparently. So there is also a lot of crossover when the road car division goes, hey, can we borrow Oscar for a weekend, please? Because all of our Australian customers are fascinated by the race team and they're fascinated by him. Uh, ultimately, the road business needs to stand on its own. It doesn't take money from the race business and vice versa is my understanding. But a strong McLaren brand across that, the composite stuff they do, and then the racing team is obviously good for all. Mm. So do you, would you, and this is a bit of financial advice we might hand out, <laughs> should you rush out and buy an Atura now before Lando Norris beats Max Verstappen for the World <laughs> Championship this year? Or do you hope and wait that they do a special Norris or Piastri version down the track? Look, I think if you do want an Artura, you should just buy the car you want. Um, I'm obviously not buying supercars. Um, I got into journalism for the money. Yes, as, um, we, do, as we all do. <laughs> yes. Uh, but one of the things that really frustrates me about the supercar world and just the really high-end car world at the moment is speculators. People buy these cars and they don't want to drive them. They want to sit on them, put them in a garage, and then hope they're worth more down the track because someone decides that the interior and exterior trim and the engine of that particular year is special. Yeah. It's not the point of these cars. And the fact that this is a plug-in hybrid, it does have that electric range, points to the fact that people can and should be driving these daily. 
I couldn't care less what's coming from McLaren. If you don't want the long tail, which will be more track focused, we assume, when it comes, there's no point waiting for a special edition because if you can afford this, you can probably afford to trade it into the special edition anyway. Cool. All right. Well, uh, I guess I'll ask one last question before we move on from McLaren. And this is to both of you. Which, if you were to pick any McLaren from history to have in your garage, money, no object, what would it F1. be? F1. Okay, done. I figured that you'd say that. I'm, I'm the same. Yeah. It's just, it's the growing up for us, we're the same age or very close to it. Uh, it, it was the, I'm slightly younger than James, so I didn't want to make a point of that despite what the looks would suggest. Um, it was the, the car. It was the fastest car in the world. It had this name that didn't apply anywhere else. It, it had no connection to anything except racing and going really, really quickly. And, and that's so special. So, and Mr. Bean owned one. So <laughs> he that's he crashed it. one. He did. Um, <laughs> so he owned two, my mistake. Yeah. <laughs> if we're talking about the modern stuff, uh, I do think that the P1 of that sort of holy trinity of hypercars as special as the LaFerrari is, I think based on everything I've read and seen of the P1, it does strike me as a bit of a, a sort of psycho monster, and that's pretty mm. exciting too. Mm. I think Clarkson called it the Widowmaker. The Widowmaker, yes. exactly. Yes, okay, well, um, leave a comment. Let us know which McLaren would you pick. Uh, I, I'm a Bogan, so I'd pick the SLR with the the uh, wall paint on it. Oh, you know, yeah, they the do the well. yeah, they do the side pipes and they do the whole Spitfire paint job yeah. on it. Yeah, I'd have one of those. That'd be cool. <laughs> but I'm a bogan. So, um, all right, uh, we wouldn't be a car expert podcast without our picks of the week. So, James, I hand it over to you first. What is your pick this week? Well, I actually sent this to you yesterday. It's like a Ford old Ford motorhome that has a V10 engine and the owner has straight piped it and then just <laughs> shows you these panning shots of this rundown, you know, caravan Winnebago looking thing. RV. Yeah, yeah an RV <laughs> as they would say. Um, um, and then, yeah, it just starts revving the hell out of it and it sounds like, you know, like a Lambo. Yeah. It's insane. I didn't know they made these. <laughs> so, well, this is cool. Old F trucks used to run V10s before, you know, emissions became a thing. So-called climate change, as they might say. Let's not, let's <laughs> not go down that I joke, I joke. Well, I that's joke, how the Dodge Viper came to be, right? They slotted a V10 truck, truck engine, engine yeah. into the front of a small sports car, and here we are. So I guess that's sort of where this came from as well, if that's from the era of American trucks that had big, good-sounding V10s. It's just a shame they weren't appreciated at the time. <laughs> it's far more fascinating than the two-and-a-half-litre clattery diesel you get in a Fiat motorhome here. So <laughs> I suppose that's a win. Scott, what's your pick this week? Uh, as this episode goes live, also, going live will be the last ever episode of the Grand Tour. Mm. Um, we are also all of an age where we grew up watching Top Gear or have had that have a really significant impact on you know why we love cars and how we love them. So I haven't seen this episode. We have no advanced screening, but my pick is the final episode of the Grand Tour as it currently stands. I'm really looking forward to watching it. And even though it might not be you know a match for the glory days of Top Gear, um, those three guys, Clarkson, Hammond and May, have had such a big impact on car culture. It's going to be a bit strange knowing they're not making you know, TV shows and films anymore. Mm. And um, I'm not, we didn't organize this, but, I, but my pick is the same as yours. Oh, there you go. Um, from a slightly different perspective though, I mean that, that, that I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be making videos about cars if it wasn't for that show. And I think that, um, you know, whilst here at Car Expert, we aren't doing the Top Gear style thing. That was never the aim or never the intention. Paul's never punched a producer <laughs> that we're aware of. Oh. Yeah, um, there's still time, but uh, you know, it's, I, I think, it's a huge loss to uh, the, not just the motoring industry, but just like car fans in general. And it, it I mean, they bred car fans. That Absolutely. Like nothing before. And I don't think anything else ever will. There was just something special about it. Well, they that. brought it to the masses, right? Like, Absolutely. They, they made cars interesting for everyone. Like I remember sitting down with my family watching Top Gear yeah. as, a, as a family, as a young kid. And it was probably because of them that I wanted to be an automotive journalist because what they did, I was like, well, wouldn't that be fun to do? <laughs> um, so, yeah, they're, they're awesome. It's a shame to see them go. I mean, they're not going far. Clarkson's <laughs> going back to his farm and James has probably got his cooking show and Hammond has a workshop now. But and they're I think all old. They are getting old. <laughs> they deserve um, to have a break. But it, but it is a bit of an end of an era, I think, and that's like uh, for, for, for most of us, for me, two-thirds of my life and probably half the majority of us. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it's a, a big thing. It's not the only thing that's uh, the last this week, <laughs> yes. is it, though, Scott? Uh, no, it's not. I'm, uh, it's a really strong transition from the end of Top Gear to, yeah, my last podcast with Car Expert. Yeah, this is, um, well, it's not as sad as Top Gear. No, I'm not even remotely <laughs> close, no. Um, but yeah, no, it's been, been really good fun. I've been with Expert for closing in on five years now, um, since it was before it was a website live and when we were sort of less than 10 employees. And it's really exciting seeing how it's grown and where it is now and I suppose where it hopefully will be in 12 and 18 and 24 months time as well. So 
yeah, really looking forward to seeing what happens with the podcast for one. So don't let us down. Uh, we'll do, we'll do um, what we can. <laughs> but with Car Expert more broadly, and uh, I'm looking forward to spending my time a little bit differently as well. Mm. So leave a message for Scott. Good, bad, indifferent, whatever. If it, uh, in if the it comments. involves the word socks, <laughs> I, I want nothing to do with it. <laughs> I also will still be haunting people for the next couple of weeks because yes. we have embargoed stuff yes. <laughs> that'll be going live. So yeah, after that, uh, there'll be someone better looking and younger than me, I assume, in this chair. I'm already Probably. here. <laughs> <laughs> um, what one of those things is true. <laughs> I, I do have to ask though, before you do go, Scott, uh, are you taking up the job as the uh, tour host in the Porsche Museum? Because <laughs> that guy retired and that's what you're oh, going to do? that would be a dream <laughs> job. Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, I will hopefully still be annoying people in the automotive industry, uh, but exactly where you will find out soon. Mm, yes, I'm just, <laughs> if you see uh, Colley Motors come up uh, <laughs> any time Motors. soon, then you'll know who's behind it. Um, well, that uh, I guess on that note, we should wrap up the podcast. Um, Thank you everyone for coming along. Um, I'm sure Scott thanks you as well. We've been doing this for well, this podcast as we know it for a year now, yeah. so it's going to be a bit of a, a bit of a shock to change it. But um, James and I will persevere. We'll we'll keep going. You make um, it sound like you're not really looking forward to it. Uh, look, we'll just have to find someone else to drive fast cars slowly. Going <laughs> yes, forward. exactly. Uh, but hopefully the next uh, our next co-host likes plug-in hybrid vehicles like the rest of us. But thank you boys for coming along. Thank you Scott for all the time you've given us over the past twelve months. We've been doing this, and thank you to all of you. We'll see you next time.